Today we are discussing dopamine. Most people know that dopamine is involved in pleasure to some extent or another. And nowadays people are starting to appreciate that dopamine is also intimately involved with motivation, drive, and pursuit. But you are also going to learn that dopamine is critical for overcoming procrastination, for ensuring ongoing motivation, and indeed for ensuring confidence. Let's now take a look at how dopamine is released. And let's keep two things in mind. We have peaks in dopamine and that peak in dopamine can rise up and then go back to what we call baseline, or there can be a trough. It can go below baseline. So the two key things to understand about dopamine is that we have dopamine peaks that are triggered by certain behaviors, certain compounds, drugs, or substances, food, et cetera, and that we have a dopamine baseline. Our dopamine baseline is our reservoir of dopamine. It's how full or empty our dopamine pool is. And that dopamine pool is the pool of dopamine that we use in order to create those dopamine peaks. And when those peaks come down, sometimes they go back to baseline and sometimes they go to lower than baseline, which we call the trough. Dopamine is not just released when we get the reward, when we get the thing that we're pursuing. Dopamine is released in anticipation of what we want. That increase in dopamine is by no happenstance, no mistake, relates also to our propensity and desire to move. So if I desire a sandwich or I desire a cup of coffee or I desire some water when I'm thirsty, there's an increase in dopamine that we could call a little mini peak in dopamine. But then here's the key thing. Very soon after I realize my desire for something, that peak that was caused by the desire comes down and drops below baseline, below the level of dopamine that it was prior to even thinking about the sandwich or the coffee or the glass of water. And it's that drop below baseline that triggers my desire to go out and find that sandwich, that coffee, that water, or that blank. Insert whatever it is that you happen to desire, action or substance of any kind or person, etc. If we are going to feel motivated at all, we are going to have to have a healthy level of baseline dopamine. So how do we achieve a healthy baseline level of dopamine? Well, there we can really look to some foundational practices. Those things include what I call the very basics. Those are going to be getting sufficient amounts of quality sleep each night. Getting sufficient sleep each night literally restores your dopamine reserves. It allows dopamine to be present and for you to have a level of baseline dopamine that will allow you to even consider your goals in any kind of meaningful or reasonable way. In addition to that, nutrition no doubt plays a role in your baseline level of dopamine because tyrosine, the amino acid, is the rate limiting enzyme for the synthesis of dopamine. We need proper nu nutrition and therefore nutrients, in particular tyrosine, in order to have sufficient levels of baseline dopamine. The third thing on the list is sunlight, morning sunlight in particular. You want to try and view sunlight as early in the day as possible, five to 10 minutes on a clear day, minimum, 10 to 20 minutes on a cloudy day, minimum, 20 to 30 minutes on a very overcast day, minimum, without sunglasses, don't stare at the sun. Why? Well, viewing morning sunlight increases cortisol early in the day, which is excellent because of the relationship between the cells in your eye that sense sunlight, specifically morning sunlight, believe it or not, that happens, and signal to your hypothalamus and the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary and other endocrine organs, it sets in motion a dopamine-related cascade in neuromodulators, dopamine, and hormones that lead to states of well-being, elevated mood, alertness, etc. throughout the day. So yes, believe it or not, that morning sunlight exposure does increase your levels of dopamine, not just cortisol. And fourth on the list is going to be movement, exercise of varying kinds. It could be resistance training, it could be cardiovascular training. That does increase levels of dopamine. What we're really talking about here is getting into a regular exercise program of if not every day, at least five days a week, a mixture of cardiovascular and resistance exercise, that we also know is known to elevate and maintain an elevated level of baseline dopamine. There are tools and techniques that you can use to elevate your baseline level of dopamine for long periods of time. And this is done in addition to the basic tools that I mentioned a few moments ago. The simplest one for which there are excellent data is that exposure of your body up to the neck to cold water has been shown to increase baseline levels of dopamine and the other so-called catecholamines, which include norepinephrine and epinephrine, but dopamine in particular for not just one, but at least two and probably as long as four or five hours. The ways to do this vary depending on the temperature. So for instance, there are data pointing to the fact that if you want to get a long lasting increase in your baseline,
baseline dopamine. You could take a very cold shower or cold plunge or ice bath for a very brief period of time, anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes, maybe three minutes, but probably 30 seconds to two minutes. I do recommend doing this early in the day. And I should mention not after strength or hypertrophy training, because within the six hours after strength or hypertrophy training, this deliberate cold exposure, especially immersion up to the neck can suppress the strength and hypertrophy adaptation that the training is designed to accomplish. So now you know how to set your baseline levels of dopamine at the highest possible level. You of course want to guard that baseline level of dopamine very carefully. So for instance, you want to avoid any kind of behaviors or substances that are going to peak your baseline level of dopamine very high or very sharply. Or if you do engage in those types of behaviors, whatever they may be, that you are well aware that your baseline level of dopamine will drop far below what it was after that peak has fallen. You will be essentially in the quote unquote trough. If however, you find yourself in that trough, you now have the knowledge to understand that that trough will resolve if you wait enough time. That baseline level of dopamine that you were at prior to the peak will come back. You will feel better. However, most people don't know that. And as a consequence, when they feel that low, that is they feel kind of amotivated, maybe a little bit depressed, maybe a lot amotivated or a lot depressed following some quote unquote peak experience, what they end up doing is thinking about what caused that peak experience and then go back and try to re-engage in the behavior and try and regenerate that peak experience. But you now know that that is a terrible strategy. In fact, that strategy will only lead to diminished peaks from the same experience. It will lead to, in many cases, pursuing more and more intense experiences to try and recapitulate, recreate that big peak, which won't work. Or even worse, people start stacking and combining different dopamine increasing behaviors in order to try and obtain something like that initial peak. When in fact, all they need to do, all you need to do is simply wait. The key point here is if you are somebody that can engage in these intrinsically joyful activities for you, these activities that you're really motivated to do, whether or not it's skiing or playing music or dancing, etc., without the need to layer in additional dopamine releasing mechanisms or compounds, or activities, well then I highly recommend you do that because then you are essentially making yourself one of those fortunate few that does not require additional stimuli and therefore can hold on to that pleasure, can hold on to that intrinsic pleasure and motivation to engage in these behaviors over time. So how can we overcome procrastination? Imagine you're in an amotivated state. You're just not feeling motivated. You're procrastinating. You may think, okay, the thing to do here is something. I'll clean the house, I'll take care of some bills, I'll do something, or I'll just wait. However, if you were to take that state of being unmotivated, of procrastinating, and actually do something that's harder than being in that amotivated state, in other words, doing something that's more effortful, even painful, you can rebound yourself out of that dopamine trough much more quickly. What I'm referring to is the fact that, for instance, if you're feeling amotivated, but you find yourself cleaning the house as a way to procrastinate, you can say, well, cleaning the house is harder than sitting down and doing nothing. But actually in that moment or in those moments, that's not the case or else you wouldn't be doing it. You need to do something and put yourself into a state that's harder than the state you're in. So for instance, if you're sitting around feeling amotivated or you find yourself tending to tasks that are irrelevant to the goal that you really should be focused on, you need to put your body and mind into a state of discomfort quickly. And the way to do that is to either engage in some tangential activity, meaning an activity not related to your goal that puts your body into a very different state. So here again, I'll default to the obvious one, which is cold shower, cold immersion, which not only increases dopamine long-term or over several hours rather, but for most people is experienced as pain. That pain causes a rebound out of that dopamine trough faster than it would occur if you had just stayed in that amotivated state and waited for it to go away or done something like cleaning up that for whatever reason felt like it required less friction. Does meditation increase dopamine? Classic forms of meditation, whether eyes open or eyes closed, so-called open monitoring or closed monitoring meditation, sitting there, lying there and focusing does not increase dopamine levels per se. However, for most people, especially people who find it hard to meditate or who don't do that practice very often, meditation is effortful. Getting into meditation and staying in meditation is effortful. So if you find yourself in a state of procrastination, 
oftentimes a brief five to 10 minute meditation where you absolutely do not allow yourself to do anything besides close your eyes, focus on your breath. And when your mind drifts, get back to your breath is not only extremely difficult and extremely frustrating, but it's often difficult and frustrating, not just to do, but to get into that practice and not just to get into that practice, but to maintain that practice for that mere five to 10 minutes. So it is effortful. In fact, it qualifies as a basically available almost anywhere, anytime type of effortful activity that if you dislike it, perhaps even as much as some people dislike deliberate cold exposure, well then perfect. You now have an additional tool in your kit that you can use anytime you are feeling amotivated and procrastinating.